Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Hello and welcome to another episode of Living the Dream with Curveball. I'm your host, Curveball, and today... I am joined by Dr. John Putalil, and today we will be talking about his books and about different health measures that he has to survive cancer, reverse diabetes, and deal with obesity. Dr. John, thank you for joining me today. Mr. Jackson, I thank you very much for having me, and I thank our listeners. Well, let's start off by telling people a little bit about yourself, give people a little history of your background and anything else that you want to tell us about yourself. I did my medical training in India. I went to Scotland to do a residency, I mean, I, I, I mean an internship. I came to this country in 1970, did two years of residency and later two years of fellowship. I practiced in the state of Texas for over 30 years. I retired about 12 years ago and started writing my books. So far, I have written four books, two on diabetes and two on cancer. Well, let's, t- let's uh, start talking about your two books on diabetes. What, what do you talk about in those books about diabetes? I don't know how many people have looked deep into diabetes. In order to prevent or reverse a condition, you need to know exactly the cause of that condition. Diabetes, the incidence of type two diabetes is increasing in this country. We are going to have at least 50 million adults with type two diabetes within the next 10 years. Now, if you go into the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases, you will see that type two diabetes starts when muscles, liver cells and fat cells become resistant to insulin or don't respond to insulin. Now, that made me start thinking. Our human body has 200 different types of cells. Why only three become resistant to insulin? Why not the 197 others? What made these, peop- these particular cells as if to join a union and decide one day, okay, we are not going to respond to insulin. What is the reason? And they, minute by minute, blood sugar control has four different enzymes. Insulin is only one of them. Why did they choose insulin to not respond? So my research into that is what resulted in these two books. What are some of the ways you you think that uh, we could What are some of the steps that we could take to prevent type two diabetes? Well, if insulin resistance is not the cause, then what is it? That is the first book I wrote, Eat, Chew, Live. That suggests how to prevent type two diabetes. Diabetes is where your blood glucose level is high. Now, there are two types of diabetes, type one and type two. In type one, the hormone insulin is not there, at least not in sufficient amounts. And that starts in early childhood. Something wrong with the pancreas, that is the organ that produces insulin. So if pancreas is damaged either by an infection or some other reason or an autoimmune disease, then 
the child will not produce insulin. Until 1920, until the discovery of insulin, these children died by the time they were age 10. After insulin was discovered and administered, these children lived just like anybody else. Their lifespan improved, their quality of life improved. So when the, the, these children were treated by endocrinologists because uh, pancreas is an endocrine organ, insulin is a hormone. So when they saw adults, when doctors saw adults with elevated blood sugar, they automatically send these patients to endocrinologists because in children with type 1 diabetes, blood sugar is also high and they were given insulin and they got better. So the doctors, sure enough, they thought it is a similar condition happening in adults. So it was called an adult onset diabetes as against the uh, type 1, which, is, which was called juvenile onset. The endocrinologist gave these adults insulin and sure enough, the glucose level went down. But then something very interesting happened. A few years later, there was a test available to measure the level of insulin in the blood, which was not available earlier on. So somebody decided to test adults who have type 2 diabetes or adult onset diabetes. And then to their surprise, they found that they had normal or even sometimes higher than normal levels of insulin in the blood. So that created a problem. Why is the blood sugar still high if they have enough insulin? So they looked at the insulin molecule. Is there anything wrong with its structure? They took that insulin from a diabetic and injected into a non-diabetic. Sure enough, the function was normal. So somebody suggested, maybe it is not the problem. Maybe the problem is not with insulin, but the cells are not responding to the presence of insulin. Now here you have to understand how does insulin work? If you have a visitor in your house or apartment, how do you know there is a visitor outside? He or she rings the doorbell and the bell rings. You know, you can go open the door and greet the person. Every cell in the body uses glucose, but when glucose is outside, the cell has no way of knowing because there is no doorbell for this glucose to ring. That is the job of insulin. Insulin is released when blood glucose level goes up after a meal. It is insulin that informs the cell that glucose is outside. That does not mean automatic entry for glucose into the cell. The cell has to send, in, send out a wagon to open the door, load up insulin, whatever is needed, and bring it in. So, if that cell decide not to send the wagon, not to open the door, insulin will be outside, glucose will be outside, but they won't get in. So this was the concept that somehow the cell is refusing entry to glucose. By the way, each cell is an independent living unit, just like your own home. Each cell can decide what nutrients to let in and what not. So the endocrinologist decided this is what is going on. Then they had to pick what cells are not responding to insulin and this they picked three types of cells as I mentioned, liver, muscle and fat cells. Why they picked those, nobody knows. Nobody knows what is the mechanism by which these cells are not responding. Is there something wrong with the doorbell? Or is the signal not going into the gene in charge? In each cell, genes control each cell action. Or the gene itself is incapacitated, 
or there is no wagon, nobody knows. And again, is the failure of response, the mechanism of failure, is it the same in the muscle, in the liver, in the fat? Nobody knows. In any scientific hypothesis, before it is accepted as fact, you have to have three things. One, logic. Second, mechanism. And third is measurement. Whether you have had type 2 diabetes for five years, 10 years, 20 years, whether you have had complications of type 2 diabetes, you don't know whether the insulin resistance is getting worse because there is no test for it. So if you inject somebody with insulin, the blood glucose level goes down. Where does it go? It is not going out of the body, but does it go into the cell that are supposedly resistant? Without a test, how do you know? You don't. So this is what made me think. Now, there is one more thing you have to consider. Even if you are a type 2 diabetic, you are supposedly resistant to insulin and not using glucose to produce energy, you can still run and play and dance, do all the physical activities. That means your muscles are producing energy. How, is the, how are the muscles doing that? Muscles are like a hybrid car that can use either gasoline or electricity to produce energy. Muscles can use either glucose or fatty acid to produce energy. What I am proposing is muscles are using fatty acid. They have sufficient amount of fatty acid in the blood so they don't need to respond to insulin. This is why it creates the appearance that the muscles are resistant to insulin. It is not they are resistant. It is because muscles don't need glucose. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Jackson? Yes, that does make sense. And speaking of high blood pressure, because our high blood sugar, I have a lot of people that have high blood sugar, including my mom. What steps um, would a person need to take to try and reverse high blood sugar? Very good question. So the question is, if you follow my line of thinking, where are the fatty acids coming from that muscles are now using to produce energy, disregarding the presence of glucose outside the cell? So let us follow that. Fatty acids are produced in the body by your liver. The liver uses glucose as the raw material to produce fatty acid. Where does the glucose come from? from your food. What type of food releases glucose upon digestion? In the modern day diet, it is primarily grains, wheat, corn, and rice. 100 years ago, the percentage of carbohydrate in the diet was less than 35%. Now, it is 50 to 70%. When is the last time you had a snack or a meal without a product from, made with grains or grain flour? Can you tell me? Um, probably almost everything because when I eat stuff, I don't necessarily look at the ingredients. I guess I should start doing that. So I yeah. don't have high blood sugar. Well, if you, your objective is to prevent it, especially with your family history, you may be concerned, are you going to get it? So this is how you can prevent it. So the grains upon digestion releases a lot of glucose. And that glucose, when they are absorbed, as I mentioned, the pancreas will release insulin. Insulin will accompany the glucose molecules to every cell in the body. The cells pick up what they need and the leftover will come back to the liver. The liver will convert that into fatty acid for storage as fat in your fat cells. Imagine if you will, your fat cells are full. 
That means the fatty acid will stay in the blood and the fatty acid level goes up, muscles switch to fatty acid burning. They are designed that way. They can automatically switch. Fatty acids can enter the cell without much trouble because the cell wall is made of fat. So fatty acid can get in without being invited. And then the fat cells can start using fatty acid, which means they don't need the alternate energy source, which is glucose. Glucose stays in the blood, and blood sugar goes up, and you are diagnosed as type 2 diabetic. Is that clear? Yes, that is clear. And speaking of fatty acids, is that one of the causes of obesity, um, dealing with the fatty acids? Or what, what is the leading cause of obesity and what can be done to prevent that? It, is, it goes along the same way of thinking. If you get more than enough glucose into the blood, the liver, as I said, has to process it. If you measure your blood sugar level after your evening meal, it will be high. But if you measure it next day morning, it is back to baseline. So where did that sugar go? The liver converted that into fatty acid. The fatty acids are sent to the fat cell. Fat cell will produce fat from the fatty acid and store it. And that is how you gain weight. So if you inject somebody with insulin, you will notice something that is they start gaining weight. So where did that come from? Because insulin instructs the liver to convert excess glucose into fatty acid and the fatty acid then to fat. That fat is sent to the fat storage area. So when you keep adding fat to the storage area, that is how you gain weight. After age 35, most of your weight gain is simple deposition of fat, not your muscle mass increasing, not your bone density increasing, just fat. This is what happens. So all you have to do is to look at your weight, what it was in your mid-20s. And most people, after that, what they add will be fat weight or weight of fat. So if you want to prevent weight gain, you have to reduce the intake of your carbohydrate or grain-based food to one half of what you are doing now. That should take care of it without any trouble. Now, you can ask the question, how do you know whether you are becoming a diabetic or some, some people call pre-diabetic? Have you ever thought about that, Mr. Jackson? Yeah, I definitely wonder about that. Uh, they call them borderline diabetics. Right. Now, the interesting part of my theory is that we inherit, we don't inherit a diabetic gene. Otherwise, whatever gene your mom had or has, you have it. And if you have inherited a diabetic gene, why are you not diabetic right now? The genes don't change, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So what you have inherited is the fat storage capacity. Suppose you have inherited a 20 pound fat storage capacity. If you gain more than that, then as I mentioned, your fatty acids will stay in the blood muscles switch to, switch to fatty acid burning, and then blood glucose will start going up. Imagine a young woman, no family history of diabetes, pregnant, eight weeks of pregnancy, she was told she has gestational diabetes. No family history of diabetes, no previous history of diabetes. Why should she become diabetic? Because the moment she got pregnant, she was encouraged to eat, not for one person, but now for two people. 
then her friends will say oh this food is good for the complexion of the body of the baby this food is good for intelligence this food is good for bone formation and this and that and she will keep eating if she fills up her fat storage capacity that she had inherited then the next thing you know her blood sugar will start going up now let's look at the reverse side a person who has inherited a 200 pound fat storage capacity can gain 150 pounds of weight and still have normal blood sugar you see some obese people there with normal blood sugar why because they have inherited a large fat storage capacity so you can use the same logic same mechanism for a lean person for an obese person for a pregnant woman without changing anything in the conventional insulin resistance hypothesis they don't know they have no explanation why a lean person should become diabetic nor do they have an explanation why a pregnant woman becomes gestational gestationally diabetic and then the diabetes goes away after delivery after she loses weight how does this happen but my hypothesis can explain those conditions now you may be you may have been told that 85% of people with type 2 diabetes in this country are obese but what you may not know is 60% of people in india who have type 2 diabetes are not obese either normal weight or even may be considered underweight so my concept my hypothesis will explain that because in india for generations we are all lean people so it doesn't take much weight gain before you have elevated blood sugar level and type 2 diabetes well that definitely dispels my myth um that you have to be overweight to be you know to have uh, diabetes issues like that so i'm, I'm glad that you told us all that me and the listeners that way we can be aware of that yes that is the part in fact you have a test if you do yearly blood test look at the the number what of what is called triglyceride triglyceride means three molecules of fatty acid connected to one molecule of glycerol that is the chemical name or the fancy name if you want to call it of the fat you store in your body that is called triglyceride that triglyceride level will start going up weeks months or sometimes years before your blood sugar start going up that is the number that you have to keep track of and that if that starts going up you are getting into trouble that means your fat cells are filled up and the fat is now staying in the blood the next thing you know is your blood sugar will start going up unfortunately we do not have a test to measure the fatty acid level in the blood that would have been better but anyway we can use the triglyceride level as a marker before you become diabetic and if that start going up that's a warning sign you need to lose some weight when you lose weight what you are losing is your fat that means you are emptying out some fat cells that means you have extra fat storage capacity so if you eat excess during a meal no problem your liver can convert that into fat and then you can store it but if you keep doing that even after your fat stores are filled up then you are asking for trouble well let's switch over and talk about cancer now like for example how can a child versus an adult you know if a child is exposed to some of the toxins that cause cancer in their short life how can they um get it quicker than an adult who's lived longer and had more of a chance to be exposed to some of the things that will cause cancer excellent question traditionally 
cancer in an adult has been explained because of accumulation of mutations over decades. The average age of an adult with cancer is 60 years plus. So it takes almost six decades of accumulation of mutations to produce a cancer cell. So your question is, a child who has not lived that long, why should a child even have cancer? That's an excellent question. That is exactly what I asked myself. And so my first cancer book is How to Survive Cancer. The second cancer book is When Your Child Has Cancer. Now, first let me explain what cancer is. Cancer is uncontrolled multiplication of cell. Now, what does that mean? If you get a cut on your skin, new cells are produced. They join in the middle and then the wound is healed. There are no more new cells being produced. In other words, the growth of that, the production of new cells is a controlled condition, controlled growth. Whereas in cancer, once they start multiplication, they don't stop, they keep on going. That is what cancer is. So in adults, as we mentioned, a cancer cell, it is called a cancer stem cell. A stem cell means it is a mother cell. The mother cell can keep on producing baby cells. These baby cells keep on producing more baby cells and that is how we have cancer. So in adults, there's a cancer stem cell that was produced because of sustaining mutations. In a child, a cancer stem cell is produced because there is a defect during the development of the stem cell in the womb of the mother. Now, let's think about this for a minute. Each human being is the product of one single stem cell. Again, let me talk about that. A, a stem cell called the zygote is formed in the womb when the sperm fertilizes an ovum. It's called a zygote. There's a single cell. And from that single cell, you produce a human being who has 30 trillion cells. So in a matter of 10 months, these cells are multiplying faster and faster to produce all the organs and systems needed for a human being. So when, it, when anything is produced that fast, mistakes happen. And each mistake in the gene is called a mutation. So in a child, mutations happen not because of exposure to cancer-causing agents as in adults, but because a developmental problem or a construction problem in the womb when these genes are constructed. So the child may be born. Now, in, in, well, in fact, let me add something more to that. The maximum number of precancerous cells in a person's body is when, the, when you are in the womb before you are born. But nature is aware of that. Nature has put in excellent uh, mechanisms in the body to either remove the uh, damaged gene or cause the cell to, with the damaged gene to, to self-destruct or there are immune cells called killer cells that can hunt down the cancer cells and destroy them. All these are present the moment you are born. So the question is, if we have that kind of facility, and mechanism. Why do you even have cancer? Now, I want you to think about this. You have a mechanism to kill 
1,000 cancer cells an hour. But the cancer cells reproduce at a rate of 1,100 per hour. In the long term, who wins? The cancer cells will win. Is there a way that you can increase to where you could kill all those cancer cells or you can only do 1,000 an hour no matter what? Well, that depends on, again, two factors. The rate of multiplication of the cancer cell on the one side and the capability of the immune system to function on the other side. In the vast majority of people, these stem cancer stem cells do not lead to cancer because our immune system can take care of it. If you look at people who develop cancer, there is nothing wrong with the immune system. Otherwise, they would have had multiple infections, for example. They don't. Children who develop cancer, they don't have bad immune systems. Otherwise, they would have had repeated infections. They don't. That leaves the other possibility, that is, the stem cells or the cancer cells are multiplying faster or outpacing the immune capability. Now, how does that happen? For a mother cell to produce a baby cell, it needs, the mother cell needs two things. One, a, a fuel to produce energy. Two, raw materials to construct new cell. And most people may not be aware of this, that cancer cells can produce energy and fabricate materials needed for new construct, uh, for cell construction just from glucose. Yes, they need only glucose and from that, they produce enough energy to produce a new cell and the leftover material can be fabricated to produce the cell. So the more glucose that is available in the system, the faster the cancer cells multiply. Cancer cells, in fact, can get glucose in. Remember, earlier we discussed how insulin works. But cancer cells have a detector outside, even without the presence of insulin, they can grab on to glucose molecules and bring them in. So if you provide an environment of high glucose content in the blood, cancer cells multiply faster because they can gorge on glucose molecules. So if you eat a diet any, with any carbohydrate, Soon after the meal, the blood sugar will go up and cancer cells will be the first ones to pick up glucose because the other cells need to wait for insulin to let them know. So this is why in the modern day diet, the high amount of carbohydrate from grains provides an environment for increased availability of glucose in the blood. And this is why the incidence of cancer is increasing all around the world. Does that make, do I make it clear? Absolutely. And, and what kind of diets would you recommend that would starve cancer cells instead of making them increase and multiply? The, and in, there is an interesting study done in Native Americans. Their incidence of cancer, all types of cancer right now is higher than what is in the white population. But let's go back to the year 1900. During the 12th census, they did, the Columbia University did a study to look at how many Native Americans suffer from cancer. And you know what? They could hardly find any. And they even proclaimed that Native Americans are immune to cancer. And they couldn't explain why, because if you look at adult cancer, 
they will be told that as you get older, you get more mutations and your chance of cancer is high. By the way, I don't know whether you know, I was diagnosed with cancer about nine years ago. So that is what started me on this journey. Anyway, so they looked at Native Americans in, in the year 1900 and they found there were 10 times more adults over the age of 95 compared to the number of white Americans per 100,000 population. So just because you are old, that does not mean you are more prone to have cancer. So what happened? If you look at the, if you think about the way Native Amer Americans were feeding themselves, they moved from one food source to another. They did not stay in one place to cultivate grains. They may have had some wild corn. Other than that, they did not have rice or wheat or cultivated corn because they moved. Whereas when they came to the reservations, most of their diet was uh, coming from grain-based foods. And so this, in my opinion, is what resulted in the present condition of not only type two diabetes, but also higher incidence of cancer in Native Americans. For parents out there dealing with a child that is diagnosed with cancer, what advice would you give them to provide support for that child? Uh, you're talking about the parents of a child, right? With cancer. Right. The parents oh. of a child that's diagnosed with cancer. Now, let us think about what is the condition right now. The parents are totally at the mercy of the cancer care team because they are afraid. They, have, they don't know what to look for and what to do because they're afraid of doing anything to make the cancer worse and they don't know how to help the child. So they look at, and they are told, oh, it is lack of exercise, improper diet, but they don't know what. So they look for advice from anybody and everybody. Yes, they can follow instructions from the cancer care team. They should continue the treatment as the doctors, the oncologists suggest. There is no question. I'm not going to interfere with that. Nobody should, unless there is a reason. So that is between the parents and the oncology, oncology team. Now, at present in the United States, there are 400,000 adults who are survivors of childhood cancer. That means in some cases, even 90% of some type of cancers can be cured or controlled or treated successfully in the United States. But many of them, almost 60% of them have some what is called late defects. Some may have memory issues. Some may have infertility. Some may have a second cancer. So just because you are uh, termed survivor, that does, you may not escape the complications, what is called late effects of treatment. And most of these late effects are related to the dosage of chemotherapy or radiation that was used to treat the cancer. So my suggestion is let us help the oncologist use less medication by controlling the growth of cancer cells, in turn using lower availability of glucose to the cancer cell to multiply. So essentially cut down the carbohydrate intake. And in the modern day diet, that carbohydrate primarily comes from 
grains. So that is where the parents can help on the one hand to limit the growth of cancer cell so that oncologists can use less medication. The second part of the equation is how to strengthen the immune system. Human body needs over 100 different nutrients to have a healthy functioning immune system. Now, there is no single food or a single meal that can provide all the nutrients needed. In fact, let me ask you this, Mr. Curtis. When you sit down to eat, do you know what nutrients your body is looking for? Nope. I just eat till I get full. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that do the same thing. Right. So if you don't know, how can anybody else know what your body is looking for? Yet, if you look at toddlers, by the way, how old are your children? My children are eight and four. Wonderful. That's an excellent age. Watch them. You will observe three things. One, they will eat only when they are hungry. Second, they will pick and choose what they want to eat. Third, when they are done, they would rather go out and play. They could care less what is left on the plate. Have you noted those? Yes, my kids are definitely picky eaters, especially my son with autism. He He's a real picky eater, and I definitely do notice okay. that. The, in, the important factor is still they are growing up normal. They are growing up, going, going, growing up fine. Why? Because they are taking enough nutrients as needed for their growth and development. So they decide what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat. If they can do that, why can't we? Right? Well, that's what I was going to ask. Why Why do people overeat? And for those of us out, out there who are obese, what is the ideal diet so that we won't continue to make issues worse for ourselves? Well, as I said, as I just mentioned, when you sit down to eat, you have no idea what your body is looking for. How much carbohydrate, how much protein, how much vitamins, how much minerals, nobody knows except your own subconscious mind. Your brain knows. Now, let me give you an example. Let us say you and I are going to a Chinese buffet. There are 100 items. How many will you choose? I know at a buffet, I tend to stuff myself more than I would if I'm just ordering like a regular entree. Okay, how many, give me a number. How many items will you choose from the buffet for lunch? Um, I, I would say about three or four, three or four. Uh, as many as I can, but about three or four. Okay, what will be the basis for choosing them? Based on what foods I like. Right. That means you have had them before. You have enjoyed them. You select. You put it on the plate. Put them on the plate. And you eat. And you enjoy. Right? right. Suppose we go back to the same buffet for supper. And this is for lunch that you had four items. Enjoy it. Will you take exactly the same four again? No, I'll probably choose something different unless it's fried chicken because I love fried chicken. When I can have it, I realize I can't have it too much. Okay. Why do you choose something different? Just because I've already had that today and I want to try something different. My taste buds might have a taste for something different or they might be serving something different at right. dinner than they were for lunch. Right. Why did that happen? You know why? Because the nutrients that your body got from the food during lunchtime, they have not been used up. They are still available for the body. However, there are deficiencies of other nutrients in the body that your subconscious brain has identified. 
And from your pre previous experience, the subconscious brain knows what food you got those from in the past, from what food. So it will change the direction and suggest something new. And you, you feel like, oh, you are consciously choosing it, choosing them. But that is a normal physiological phenomenon. That is why your children, for example, they pick and choose what they like because their subconscious mind is, uh, is telling them what food contains nutrients that their body needs at that time. So that is why it is changing. The only the subconscious mind knows. You know, sometimes you may prepare food thinking that, oh, they enjoyed it last time. But this time they may not even touch it. They said, I don't want it. Or sometimes they may ask for something other than what you have prepared. It is your subconscious mind keep tracks of all these hundred different nutrients. And when the deficiency of the total number of nutrients at that time reaches a threshold level, that is when it creates the sensation of hunger. This is why you can never predict when you are going to be feeling hungry next time. Can you? Not that I know of. I've never been able to. If you right. eat a light meal, you might be hungry, hungry quicker than you would be if you ate a good breakfast or if you didn't eat breakfast at all. You might exactly. get hungry a little quicker. Exactly. So your brain keeps track of what, when, uh, what is missing when it is time to eat. Now, let me tell you this story. A few years ago, I asked 10 overweight adults to note down the time they felt the sensation of hunger and the time they ate for three days in a row. Four out of 10 never felt hungry for those three days, yet, that did not stop them from eating. So I, I asked, why? Why did you eat? And their reply was, because it was time to eat. So we get conditioned. And you know when that conditioning starts? At age six. So your eight-year-old is very susceptible now when you tell him, you better finish what is on your plate. There are starving children in India, in China. You don't want to waste food. We won't have time to stop along the way. We are driving. All these gradually changes the, the mechanism of nutrient intake. And that is what happens as we get older. Then of course you join a sports team in the school. And you, have, you just have no time to eat. You gobble up whatever you can, the shortest time available. You're working. You, know, you, you are eating and working at the same time. You're too busy to sit down and enjoy your meal. Am I making it clear? Yes, you are definitely making it clear. And I appreciate that. I'm sure the listeners will as well. Now, there is one more factor here. How, how do you know how much is enough during each meal? As an adult, once you put it on the plate, you're going to finish it because that is how you have been conditioned. Whereas if you look at the child, the child has no such uh, desire. It will eat what the child needs, not what was served. Why? What's the difference? How does that happen? Do you know? I think it's just conditioning because as you said, your parents make sure that you don't waste the food and they tell you, you eat what I give you versus um, an adult, you, you know, they have a choice and they, they, they just grew up with that. Well, I'm not going to waste food. I'm going to go ahead and eat this. Right. But my question is this. So how does the child know when to stop? You don't eat the same volume of food each time, do you? Nope. But I nope. think, like you said, the brain keeps track of it and, and 
lets them know when they have what they need. It's exactly. probably going to be quicker than adults. Exactly. So what is the mechanism? Let me give you an example. Suppose you are thirsty right now. I bring in 12 ounces of water. How much do you think it will take to quench your thirst? Can you predetermine? Nope. But no. sometimes if you're a little more dehydrated, I know I can tell that I need a little more water than I usually would because you can just kind of feel your body taking it in saying, yes, thank you for this. Right. But you cannot predetermine. Right. No, you can't. Yeah. How long will it take for you to drink water right now to quench your thirst? If the water's warm, I, I can drink it pretty quick because I, I tend to drink a lot of water uh, during okay. the day. So a couple of minutes? Yeah, something like that. Okay. By the time you finish drinking, your thirst is quenched, right? Correct. Where is that water? That water is still in your stomach. It has not been absorbed into the body yet. Right? Right. How did the brain know you had enough water to quench your thirst at this time? And as you said earlier, if you are dehydrated, you will need more. Yet, you may take maybe instead of two minutes, four minutes, and then you stop drinking. So what, what precise mechanism tells the brain you had enough. Have you ever that, thought about that? That is interesting. Is there such a mechanism or does your brain just know? How, how can it know? Brain is just an organ that receives signals. That signal has to come from someplace for the brain to know how much has gone down. Does it come what? from your kidneys? I'm sorry? Does it come from your kidneys? No, by the, for, the, for the water to reach kidneys, it has to be absorbed first. That takes some time. The mechanism is what I describe in my first book, Eat, Chew, Live. What I'm proposing in that book is, suppose you are given something to drink, you are blindfolded. You will know, how will you know whether it is water or wine or coffee or tea or beer? How will you know that? You'll know it by the taste. Exactly. Those taste buds are not only telling the brain what you are consuming, but also metering how much is going down. The brain already knows what the deficit is. When the taste buds report to the brain so much has gone down, when that matches, the quantity matches the deficit, the brain creates the sensation of quenching. For example, if you go next time and put the water straight into your throat, pour the water, you will end up drinking more. You can try it. So when you eat, what I am suggesting is there is a similar mechanism to monitor and meter nutrients that are going down the throat. Your taste buds and your smell receptors are designed to do that. In order for them to work, you have to let the nutrients come in contact with the taste buds. And this is the reason why in nature, every food that adult humans can get nutrients from, they, are, they all require Chewing. Can you think of something in nature that you can eat and get nutrients from without chewing? Not that I can think of. It, it takes some kind of chewing for right. pretty much everything. So one problem in the modern day diet is people eat too fast. They are not giving the taste buds a chance to register and meter how much is going down. The second is if you boil some rice, can you enjoy rice by itself? Uh, it, it, uh, you got to eat it with something. At least I do. Right. Uh, rice and gravy, rice and chicken. Right. Why is rice not enjoyable by itself? Well, it's kind of plain uh, right. to me. Well, 
why do you feel like that? What I am suggesting is you feel like that because nature never meant rice for humans. In my theory, if rice was meant for humans, we would have had beaks to pick it up. And we would have the capability to digest the chaff. We don't. The agricultural revolution 60 years ago, along with the help from the federal government in the form of farm subsidy, made it made it possible to produce grains in abundance. And the milling and refining made everybody a cook because you can make so many things from grain flour. And that increased food consumption, food made with grain flour. And this is the problem we are trying to solve right now. And that is the direct connection between the grain-based foods, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. So this is how the whole story starts, which is easier. Than almost all the cheap food available right now, all the convenient food available right now in the United States are mostly made with grain flour products because the federal subsidy makes it cheaper compared to vegetables or other foods. So coming back to the cancer, in order to have a healthy immune system, you need to cut down on the one hand the grain-based foods, but increase the availability of other nutrients that come from vegetables, fruits, nuts, and add spices and herbs to that. That is how you strengthen the immune system of the child so that the child can fight any multiplication of cancer cells, keep the number of cancer cells under control so that the doctor can use less medication and the child will have less late effects. Well, let's stay on the subject of boosting their immune system, but talk about bacteria infections. What strategies do you have for us to be able to boost our immune system and protect ourselves from harmful bacterial infections? When you have bacterial infection, one thing is, the most important thing is to prevent them getting into your body. So you need to practice all the hygiene measures or the cleanliness that you need to do to prevent them getting in. Because if you get only a small dosage, your immune system can take care of it. So you need to decide, is it coming into your body through water? In which case, if the number of bacteria entering the body is less, your gastric acidity can take care of it. Or if you are inhaling, again, your immune system can take care of it before they multiply. Because all you are getting is a dose a small number of bacteria, they need to have a place to multiply before they cause an infection. And as far as the immune system is concerned, it is the same immune system. So to boost the immune system, it is the same number of uh, steps. Have a variety of vegetables, because as I said, you need 100 different nutrients. You cannot get it from one particular food or meal, you need multiple foods, multiple um, food items. So if you eat, the, if you follow the same criteria as I just mentioned earlier, a variety of vegetables, fruits, nuts, spices, herbs, you can have, and you can add animal products if you like, or if you don't like, that's fine too. Think about it. In every part of the globe, there are people living into their 80s and 90s, eating what is available locally. In other words, nature has packaged all nutrients human needs, but in different types of shapes of food or different color, different flavor, it doesn't matter. As long as they get into your body, the body can take care of. 
Talk about the APEX plan that you propose that we use to stay healthy in a pandemic like COVID-19 that we're in right now. Well, A is for uh, avoiding crowds. Uh, as you know, and everybody knows that. P is for practicing hand washing and uh, um, other sanitary measures. E is we have to uh, pr protect our immune system or you know, encouraging or empowering the immune system. The X was for cutting down the amount of grain flour foods or grain-based foods to half because those who have uh, health problems such as obesity, diabetes, and cancer, they are more prone to compl severe complications of COVID-19. That means our normal immune system can take care of it unless the viruses multiply faster. By the way, COVID-19, it's a virus, it is not a bacteria. What that means is a bacteria can multiply by itself. It is like a normal cell or an abnormal cell. Whereas virus cannot do that. They have to get into a cell, take over the machinery of that cell for duplication and they multiply inside. Most of the viruses, especially COVID in this case, you are inhaling that virus. It gets into your body through your nose or your mouth, or very rarely through your eyes. In that goes into your sinuses and there they get into the cell, take over the cell machinery for multiplication, produce more copies. And when they burst out of that cell, it drops down into your lungs. And if you have a problem, a health issue, then they start multiplying in the lungs and that is when you get into trouble. 95% of the people will survive COVID-19 without any problem. However, if you have a pre-existing health condition, regardless of your age, you can have severe, severe complications. So when the virus is multiplying inside the cell, it needs just like every other uh, multiplying cell, it needs energy, it needs um, materials for reconstruction. And again, the more glucose you have in your blood or after a meal, more insulin is released. And glucose provides the energy and construction material for fabrication of new viruses. But in addition, insulin promotes all activities of the cell, including virus production. So if you are a diabetic, if you take a high uh, glucose containing meal or carbohydrate meal, immediately after a meal, the insulin level is high. It promotes viral growth, bacterial growth, cancer cell growth. It doesn't matter. The insulin cannot distinguish what is good, what is right. It, can, it just promotes all cellular activities, including viral reproduction. So if you want to be healthy, cut down the intake of grains, keep social distancing in this time of pandemic, produce, um, do hand washing. And this way you can reduce, and of course, wear a face mask. If you do that, we can get over this together. Everybody has to pitch in. You have to look after your own neighbor. That is what this is all about. For all of my listeners out there who might be writers or wanting to become writers, what advice would you give them after writing four books? The first thing is be curious. You have to have a subject matter that you are 
excited in. And you need to have an objective. What, why am I writing this? You have something that you want to share with your audience. And once you develop that, then the third thing is, how do you, what's the medium? How do you make it understandable? In that, you may need help from an editor or a publisher, but you can take notes, you can have the idea already put together and the way you want to communicate about a subject that you are so passionate about or interested in, especially if the subject and the way you talk helps other people. So you need to have a motivation to do that. You need to have a subject that you're interested in and then you be curious as to where can you get the information from, how to put it together, then get the help of somebody who can write it for the appropriate audience. Is there anything that you would like to talk about that we have not yet touched on? Well, I can keep talking, but it is what your listeners are interested in. At this stage, all I can say is each person has to be in charge of his or her own body. Otherwise, it will not work. If you, whether you, whatever ailment that you have, whether it is obesity, type two diabetes, cancer, COVID, you have to be in charge. And you can also look after your neighbor by first you have to be in charge of your own body, then you help others. Well, throw out any contact information, any website information where people can go to purchase your books and also any uh, future projects that you're working on currently. Let the listeners right, know about that. Right now, all I'm most my my interest is how to make the, my concept of type two diabetes. Uh, people who are diabetic or pre-diabetic, they should start asking questions as to if I take insulin, if I take a medication, where is that sugar going? You know, for example, if you are resistant to an antibiotic, will you take the same antibiotic to treat an infection? Will you? No, because it won't work. Right. But in type 2 diabetes, you are told you are a diabetic because you are resistant to insulin. But what do they give you? So we need to have clear answers. So that is what my I'm concentrating on right now. So the, the people who are listening to me, if they have diabetes, start asking questions. And that is what I would like to see right now. My books are available on Amazon. I have a website, drjohnonhealth.com. You can follow me on Instagram or Facebook, Dr. John on Health. So books are available on Amazon. And my website is drjohnonhealth.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John Putaleo. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. dream.